All right, our next panel will be Michelle Lewin, Executive Director of the Parole Preparation Project, and Jose Saldana, a Community Organizer for the Release Aging People in Prison Campaign. Okay, you ready? Ready. We just saw um, the statements that you, you had here, and we have a copy of uh, the report that was prepared mm -hmm. by the, your two organizations. Mm -hmm. that you, that we did want to talk about. So there's a lot of materials there. Well, Senator, before you begin, I would like to read uh, my statement. Pardon me? I would like to read my statement on the record. It, it'll be on the record anyway. I understand. And my hope would be that you could paraphrase the high points of it and emphasize it your own questions. You can read it if you want. But like I said, it is in the record now, mm -hmm. now that it has been submitted. <coughs> yeah, I'll go ahead and read it. So yeah, thank I you. I think because you spoke first, ladies first. Well, unless you want no, you guys no, no, no. We, you we guys discussed it. it. We discussed it. Thank you. Oh, uh, there we go. All right, go right ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't have the microphone on. My name is Michelle Lewin, and I'm an attorney in New York State and the executive director of the Parole Preparation Project. Founded in 2013, the project supports and advocates for the release of people serving life sentences in New York State prisons. We also help lead the statewide campaign for parole justice. In addition to running the Parole Preparation Project, I coordinate a contingent of attorneys working on parole-related litigation across the state, and I'm deeply familiar with parole policy and procedures. I'm considered an expert in this issue, and I consult on cases nationwide. To be plain about it, our work is about advocating for the release of more community-ready people from prison, especially people convicted of violent crime decades ago. It is about ensuring that parole eligible people have a fair and meaningful opportunity for parole and that their freedom is not determined by a political agenda, a special interest group, or an antiquated approach to quote law and order. Our work is about promoting public safety, healing, and justice. Before addressing any arguments in greater detail and answering your questions, I want to outline some of the core principles that guide our movement for parole justice and from our perspective should guide the criminal legal system at large. We believe that all people are valuable and that regardless of the harm a person has caused, they deserve to be treated with dignity, respect, and compassion. Further, no lives are more valuable than any other, including the lives of law enforcement. We also see the humanity in all people and recognize and that people harm others for a whole host of reasons, often related to their own trauma and the ways in which we as a society have failed them. Violence stems from the painful realities of structural oppression, including racism and white supremacy. We also define people by who they are today. We do not define people by the worst thing they've ever done, but by their accomplishments, their aspirations, their personal transformations, and their acceptance of responsibility. All people are capable of change and of making incredible contributions to their communities. So many of our leaders in the parole justice movement who are here today with us were convicted of serious crimes decades ago and have made tremendous contributions to our world. Further, we believe that the only determinative factors that should be used when assessing a person's readiness for release are these forward-looking markers, their achievements, their personal growth, and their potential risks to public safety. Lastly, and most importantly, we honor the experiences of all those who are harmed by crime and violence. We believe wholeheartedly in a victim's right to seek healing and restoration in the many forms those take. We do not suggest that there should be no accountability for harming other human beings. There absolutely should. What we do not support is the current process rooted solely in punishment that serves no other purpose than to banish and indefinitely warehouse those who cause harm. We do not believe such a system helps our communities overcome the effects of crime and violence, nor does it soothe wounds, bring resolution, or keep any of us safe. And just for a bit of history, and we've discussed some of this on the record already, but I'll, I'll review. Um, in 2011, the New York State Legislature amended the executive law governing parole to require the board to use a risk assessment instrument in their release determinations. The goal was to further a, quote, forward-looking, holistic, and rehabilitative approach. In September 2017, the Board of Parole also revised their regulations in a similar vein, this time with even more emphasis on the role of, quote, risk and needs evaluations. The regulations now state that if the board departs from their risk assessment instrument and denies release, then it must give an, quote, individualized reason for such a departure. What I have heard others testify about today and what Senator, Senator Gallivan has claimed in several public appearances is that advocates misunderstand the law. 
Senator Gallivan claims that the executive law that governs parole has within it an inherent requirement that the parole board consider a community's opposition to a person's release when making their determinations and should weigh that opposition heavily. This is not the law. The passage in dispute states that release shall be granted so long as it, as it is not, quote, incompatible with the welfare of society and will not so deprecate the seriousness of his crime as to undermine respect for the law. Other than this vague phrase, the executive law contains no factor requiring the board to consider, quote, community opposition, a refrain we hear repeatedly from state senators and state Republican senators. In fact, courts have held that the only opposition the board may consider is the testimony from victims directly impacted by the crime and their families and the district attorney. It is the job of the parole board, not special interest groups, to make individualized, independent decisions about someone's freedom. The quote, community opposition state senators in the parole board reference is also shrouded in secrecy. Parole applicants and their advocates are not permitted access to the so-called opposition, and in some cases, upon judicial action, have discovered it never really existed at all. In other instances, community opposition merely refers to a petition signed by people who have no knowledge of the case or any connection to the victim or their family. There is nothing in the law that prohibits parole applicants from seeing this material. And if Senate Republicans and members of the board are so adamant about its power, then it should be made available to the very people it impacts most. Senate Republicans claim that releasing anyone who has killed a member of law enforcement would so, quote, deprecate the seriousness of the crime and therefore violate the law. What is actually unlawful is their demand that the board issue blanket denials of people based solely on their crimes of conviction. Senate Republicans are also saying that no amount of time, rehabilitation, or transformation could meet the deprecate standard and that the Board of Parole should resentence all people with these crimes to life without parole. Sentencing remains within the purview of the courts, not the board. Significantly and perhaps surprisingly to this committee, the new regulations published in 2017 eliminate altogether the quote welfare of society and deprecate language, perhaps in light of how impossible it is to implement such vague premises. While these phrases remain in the executive law, they appear nowhere in the revised version of the regulations. Even if commissioners were permitted to consider input from the general public, the question remains, which public and whose community are you even referring to? It seems you refer just to your own constituency, and even then it is not clear that your throw away the key mentality is shared by your voters. Undermining respect for the law also does not refer to undermining respect for law enforcement officers. It refers to the legal system. Further, the vast majority of people living in communities where people in prison and most victims come from believe that continued incarceration and death behind bars in no way serves the welfare of society. Bringing people home, reuniting families, and restoring fractured communities is the only form of welfare we seek. Distorting the law in this way is an attempt by Senate Republicans to erase the progressive amendments made to the executive law in 2011 and the regulations in September 2017. It is an attempt to amplify and exaggerate the minority of voices in this state who want perpetual punishment and believe death in prison is the only form of justice. It is, it is an attempt to silence black and brown communities that have for decades fought for the release of their loved ones. The amendments to the regulation as well as the appointment of new commissioners in June 2017, commissioners this very committee confirmed has led to an increase in release rates. Just last month, the Board of Parole released 48% who appeared before it. We welcome and celebrate these changes with an air of caution and skepticism. Even with increased releases, more than 50% of people appearing before the board are denied parole and remain locked up and away from their families. The board's policies still profoundly and disproportionately impact people of color and more specifically black men. The board's practices also systematically deny release to aging and elderly people. Many parole eligible people serving life sentences are over the age of 50 with some entering their 60s and 70s. This mass aging in prison, which is happening not only in New York State but across the country, means we are building nursing homes inside prison walls and graveyards on prison grounds. I mean this literally. Let's be clear that in New York State, repeatedly, repeatedly denying someone parole means sentencing them to die in prison. When Republican senators say people who kill police officers should not be released, what they mean is that they should die behind bars. 
I want to close that by saying that while we are here participating in this process, we see these hearings as a political ploy and as an attempt to scare voters into reelecting you in November. Your proposed policies do not serve any of your stated goals of public safety, protecting victims, or law and order. They are purely for punishment and nothing else. Further, your characterization of incarcerated people and those who have been convicted of violence as dangerous, barbaric, terrorists, and other words I am ashamed to repeat, is not only factually inaccurate, but racist, bigoted, and harmful. The same is true of your efforts to disenfranchise people on parole who only recently obtained the right to vote. Elected officials across this country use fear-mongering, deception, and hate to rally their constituents, and you are no different. I am hopeful that in November, community opposition will refer not to a small contingent of law enforcement opposing the release of aging people in prison, but the masses who have finally decidedly said enough. No more perpetual punishment, no more death in prison. Mr. Saldana? Yes, I'm a community organizer with RAP, Release Aging People in Prison Campaign. We work to end mass incarceration by advocating for the release of the older prisoners in New York State who have languished in prison, some for over four decades. I came here to advocate on their behalf. I think they would want me to speak for them. But I want to pause for a few minutes and respond to something that occurred just a few minutes ago. You mentioned the murder of two New York City police officers and the devastation that it caused their family and their community. May no mention that that very year, 92, teenage boys, young black men were murdered by New York State, New York City police officers. 92 families, not mentioned, not one single word happened the same year. Their lives didn't matter, but they matter to me, and they matter to our community. And all the people who were incarcerated for violent crimes for 40 years, their lives matter to us. And they have shown their worth, and I have seen their worth up front. I've languished with them for 38 years. I know who these men are. 38 years, I've seen them develop the best therapeutic programs possible. Why? Because New York State Department of Correction does not educate. They do not rehabilitate. So we take it upon ourselves to rehabilitate ourselves, to create programs like a challenge to change, to address criminal thinking, attitude, and behavior. We develop victim awareness programs that will help us develop insight into the harm that our crimes inflicted on innocent people. We develop anti-violent programs, gang prevention programs, to help these teenagers that are at risk to becoming gang members. And these men have been doing this for decades. They're not faking, because once they let us out, they have let a few of us out. And they continue to do the same thing, exact same thing. You will find them in the worst neighborhoods addressing the gang violence, because what happens in our communities matters to us. We are concerned with the plight, the social and economic conditions in our community. I realize that you, y'all ain't concerned about that. You weren't concerned back then, you're not concerned now. You're concerned about your own constituents. You're not concerned about Brownville, Spanish Harlem, East New York, we are. We've come from prison after decades to address these issues. That's our work. That should be the measure of who we are today, not back in 1979 or 1971. That's all I have to say. Well, 
thank you for being here. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear that uh, you're here participating, but you see this as a political ploy. If I saw it as a political ploy, I wouldn't be sitting here asking questions. I wouldn't have immersed myself in hours and hours of research uh, and wouldn't, wouldn't go through this. You have your opinion, but I can tell you from my perspective and my co-chair's perspective, that is not accurate at all. New York State lawmakers, I think it was in 2005 or perhaps it was a little bit earlier, uh, they have made the, the murder of a police officer punishable by life in prison. Mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans, that is the state of the, of the current law. The changes that were made uh, to the parole regulations were in response to a New York State statute and to the Supreme Court. And I'm not going to read it, but it'll be available uh, in the ultimate record. But that is something that the chairwoman of the board clearly articulates. The chairwoman of the board in a written testimony also clearly articulates all of the factors that must be considered. She articulates the fact that the courts have uh, essentially uh, placed it on the board to determine the weight. And the standards are the standards. And when I speak from that, uh, when I speak in talking about the standards and, and I talk in certain cases where I think members of the parole board uh, failed the citizens that they serve, the citizens they serve, sir, are just like me. Yes, I have a district, but every citizen in the state is a constituent. And I recognize when I make my decisions, I affect people and families. And my decisions aren't always right, but I recognize the constituency is across the state, and I care about people. You may not know that my uncle was murdered. You may not know my, that my uncle lived on the east side of Buffalo in a very poor area, was stabbed 27 times. You may not know much about my personal family that I'm not going to go into. I understand that you made some very, uh, one in particular, a very inaccurate comment about my time on the parole board. You don't know what my release rate was. You don't know the people that I released. But I can tell you that the statement that you made about that is absolutely wrong. And while I don't even think it's merited, but out of respect, like you being at this hearing today, if you would like to sit down and go over that, and I can show you what is accurate, I'm happy to do that. I had wanted to take the time to go into the, into the report um, and ask about the objectivity of it, ask about how many cases were looked at, ask about how much information was obtained by the parole board, but because of how you characterize it, I, I, it appears that there's no need to do that today, but we do appreciate the time that you guys took to be here and your patience. Thank you very much.